Now on BBC Two, Jeremy Isaacs talks to Paul Eddington in a moving interview first shown shortly before he died. Paul Eddington, you're one of our best and best loved actors, both on television, The Good Life, yes, Minister, yes, Prime Minister, and on the stage in Stoppard, in Pinter, in David Storey's home. In the very deft and readable autobiography you've just published, So Far So Good, you tell us what I suppose viewers can perhaps now see for themselves, that you have cancer of the skin. When did you first learn that that was the case? Not until comparatively recently, I mean within the last few years, I noticed some red patches on my skin that over the years grew and multiplied, but they were on my trunk and they didn't bother me and they weren't irritating or anything like that, so I thought, as they're simply cosmetic, I'll wait till they get to my face before doing anything more serious about it. But in the meantime, I went up and down Harley Street and all around the National Health Service and got no sensible answers, really, at all. And I found myself in Brisbane, just about at the same time that my face started to be affected. So I discovered, through some friends I had made in uh, Melbourne, who the best man in Brisbane was, went to him, and he suggested that it was something called mycosis fangoides, which wouldn't have meant anything to me, except that uh, a friend of mine had confessed to me that he'd had the same thing not long ago, and he had since died, so that startled me a little. That was Colin Blakely? Colin Blakely, yes. Well, how did you react to the discovery of precisely what it was? Ah, dismay. I suppose. Uh, after a little while I got over the dismay. Um, I was even a little excited by the drama of the fact that I'd got cancer. <laughs> it sounds quite ridiculous. But I thought, gosh, this is something really serious. Having been someone who all my life had always had a touch of cancer, you know, to really find you've got the real thing was very interesting. How many years ago was that? I think about... Uh, about ten years ago. Yes, about that, I think. So you've held your own pretty well? Uh, until quite recently, when it started to gallop a little bit. And uh, I thought I would say nothing about it, because it didn't affect me or my work all that much and uh, tried to keep things to myself. Unfortunately, rumours started to get around and somebody from the News of the World had his foot in my door before very long. And uh, I kept them at bay for as long as I could and they were really making my life very uncomfortable and I was peering out of the window to see if anybody was around before making a dash for my car and things like that. And uh, eventually my agent said, oh, I I think you'd better hire a publicist and come clean, so that's what I did. And actually, it, it worked quite well, because the excitement died down. I think they were hoping against hope that I might have AIDS, you see. I mean, respectable married man, grown-up family, it'd be a lovely story, wouldn't it? And, uh, <laughs> and uh, disappointed, they turned away. You've had a heavy workload, big parts in major West End productions while uh, suffering from this illness, and indeed while undergoing sometimes daily radiotherapy. How, how did you manage to get on stage in the evening and, and entertain the public and perform? I had a car to drive me to work. I had a bed in my dressing room. And uh, when my call came, the adrenaline raised me from my bed and thrust me onto the stage. <laughs> When you were doing Home uh, with Richard Breyer, yes. um, and th I suppose this was when you became bald, and you thought at one time of playing the part with a hat on, 
and then decided to take it off. Tell me about that. Well, was I it was a big decision. I was, I was, yes, it was really. I was, I was terribly nervous and terribly self-conscious and terribly shy about it. And um, rather like now, I'm dabbing my nose. You notice because I've had some treatment to my eyes, which makes them water. I, I just was frightened of the look of myself without any hair, and with these blotches on my face. I couldn't do much about the blotches, but the the hair was a worry. And the author and the director, David Story and uh, David Laveau, begged me to take my hat off and said it would be perfectly all right, but I shrank from it. But eventually I thought, this, it's no point in this. I've, I've really got to face it. And uh, if I'm famous for anything now, it must be famous for being a bold actor and one with blotches on his face. So I uh, thought, well, there we are. You write in that lovely book of the courage, finding the courage to appear as myself. How did you find that courage? Well, I think... I haven't thought of this before, but it might be part of our training. Because I think, uh, as modestly as I can put it, acting does require a great deal of courage. Everybody, every actor who goes through a first night, once you're through it and rolling, that's fine. But beating up to a, a first night and doing the first night is agony. And every actor asks himself, why on earth he or she is doing this, uh, this job? And having that courage to go out and face things like that. Uh, I imagine it's a bit like a soldier, you know, you, 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 you've got to do it. So take a deep breath and do it. You haven't any alternative. I'm not, people uh, are kind enough to say how brave and all the rest of it. I'm not brave at all. I, I do wish very sincerely that I hadn't got this problem. But as I have it, there's no alternative but just to say, yes, I've got it. You're still working. Have you bidden farewell to television? Uh, very nearly. I thought I had this summer when I was asked by a producer to do a film, and I said, well, we haven't met for some time. O ought you to come and have a look at me, because I'm not quite the same as when you know me, knew me last. And she did, and she said, yeah, no, that's fine. And I, I was still uneasy, and I said, well, let's have a film test. Let's have a makeup test. And we did, and she read a regretful letter saying, I'm sorry, the it's a major part, and the cameras simply won't be able to come in close enough. So I thought, oh, well, that's that. And uh, then the BBC asked me to do Henry IV, playing Justice Shallow. And I said, uh, I do look grotesque, you know. And they said, no, 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 what we want. <laughs> so perhaps, you know, perhaps a revival of uh, The Elephant Man or maybe The Man in the Iron Mask I could manage. But otherwise, I think I shall have to probably confine myself to radio. Where, we, where and when were you born? I was born in London, boringly, in uh, what we like to call either Hampstead or St John's Wood, but what I think in the light of hindsight may probably have been Kilburn. Uh, my parents were... always well, we had the feeling that they were on the way up a little bit. Who was your father? My father was a man called Albert Clark Eddington. The Clark was his real family name. He came from the Clarks who make shoes in Somerset. And an old Quaker family, although that had nothing to do with him by the time he married my mother. Uh, he was a, a terrible failure. Bless his heart, I loved him very much. But he was a gambler, a hopelessly addicted gambler, and I can remember one day, only one, where the kitchen was full of those huge white fivers we used to have. <laughs> You're too young to remember. Uh, but most of the time we were selling the furniture. And in fact, something I didn't know until after I'd written the book, that my sister actually came home from the holidays once. I was elsewhere to find that my father had got a bed and a table. The bailiffs had been in. He fought in the First World War. He did. He was up to his neck in mud and blood for four years, and I think it must have 
totally dispirited him. He got a whiff of gas at Ypres and a little bit of a trench, what was called trench foot, uh, but wasn't harmed otherwise, but I think deeply scarred, in fact. And who was your mother? My mother's name was Frances Roberts, and she was born of Irish parents. She was, in fact, born in a workhouse. Not an inmate, but my grandparents were master and mistress. And uh, as Irish people, they were Roman Catholics. It was quite interesting, because she had to get dispensation in order to marry my father. And the terms of the dispensation, as was usual then, were that the children should be brought up as Roman Catholics, which we were, my sister and I. Was it a happy marriage? No, it wasn't. My father's gambling ruined that. And it had been over a long time before I think I admitted it to myself. I remember I was about 15, and a, a senior at my school, it was, it was ridiculous, because I'd been spending holidays with school friends and friends of friends, and away here and away there, and sometimes with my mother, never, I think, with my father. And it wasn't for years that I, I must have known, I must have known, I think, but I didn't admit it to myself that it was all over. Looking back, would you say your childhood was unhappy? Well, no, not really. Children accept these things in a most remarkable way. I just thought that was the way of life. One didn't go home at the holidays, and one didn't see much of one's parents. Uh, my father was in one place, my mother was in another. That seemed perfectly normal, or so I told myself. <laughs> You went to many schools because you moved around a lot, didn't yes. you? But then you went to a Quaker school. Was That's that right. important to you? Was that important to you? Oh, absolutely vital. Uh, my mother became interested. She, she was always very radical in her politics. As a very small girl, she had seen the workless of I think it was Leek in Staffordshire, march on the, uh, on the workhouse, which represented for them the local Bastille. And my grandfather apparently chained the gates and turned the fire hoses on them. And my mother, watching these ragged people being tumbled about the street, thought there was something wrong here and began to question things. And if you're a Roman Catholic, at any rate in those days, you you couldn't really question things, you just got to do what you were told, but she did. And when the Civil War happened, she very much disagreed with the, the Pope's, what she saw as the Pope's indeterminate views, perhaps, on the, uh, on the outcome of the war. No, his support for Franco, let's be frank about it. And uh, she, she then quarreled with the Pope, I didn't think the Pope was aware of it. But <laughs> she, at the time, was having little meetings at home with uh, friends of hers, at which she would recruit a prominent fascist, the black shirts were very much in, act in action then, or a prominent communist, or I think Father Darcy, the Jesuit, came to speak on one occasion, and on another, a saintly man called John Fletcher came to talk about Quakers, and um, uh, funnily enough, it was nothing, I think, to do with my father, but she became very interested in what the Quaker man had to say, and when the marriage came to an end, and it was necessary, my sister was three years older than I, and was already trying to earn her own living, when it was necessary for me to go to boarding school, this man, who happened to be on the Friends Ed Education Committee, as it then was, uh, suggested that as my father and grandfather had both been at Quaker schools, and I could therefore, with a little bit of Jesuitical reasoning, <laughs> be determined uh, a birthright Quaker, there's no such thing nowadays. I went to this uh, very modest school, modest in fees, uh, and paid even fees that were reduced then. It's now more expensive than Eton, I believe. What did being a Quaker mean to you? What does it mean to you? 
Well, I had reached a stage where I, I thought the Mass was in Latin then, and I didn't understand Latin, and nor, as far as I could see, the best of the congregation. They were just following in the prayer book and standing up and kneeling down and crossing themselves and averting their eyes from the, uh, from the altar at various points. And I didn't know what to confess to when I went to confession. I've been rude to my mother and father. I used to say routinely, come out feeling very cleansed. And I thought, this is really all a lot of rubbish. I've, I've, I've grown rather more tolerant in my old age. But finding Quakers was like an oasis in the desert. Silence is the centre of Quaker worship. And an hour of silence, which it very often is, was most refreshing. And I liked the, the political and social conclusions that most Quakers arrived at. And you followed several such paths in your life, including um, becoming a conscientious objector uh, at the end of the Second World War. Yes. Is that a direct result of being a Quaker? Was, it? was that? Were you always a pacifist? Yes, and of course listening to my mother's uh, my mother's uh, politics and, and way of thinking. I very much influenced by her and followed her when it came to an interest in Quakerism. But I wasn't actually a member of the society then, but I was very much under the influence of the way my school had felt. It was rather wonderful being at a school during the war, which was against the war, which was pacifist, terribly, deeply unpopular, but one felt one could be rebellious, yet within the discipline of a school. It was very strange. <laughs> Why did you become an actor? I, I say sometimes, uh, perhaps too self-deprecatingly, that uh, it was because I got, couldn't really do anything else, but there's a grain of truth in that. My school uh, was not an academically inclined one. If you wanted to go to university, you had to go to an, another Quaker school, to, which had a sixth form. And when I left school, uh, my parents apparently didn't know anything about higher education, and certainly hadn't any money, and there didn't seem to be any question of my having higher education. I, I didn't know what to do. I wanted to do something artistic because those were the sort of circles we seemed to move in. We knew sculptors and painters and things like that. And I thought, I must do something artistic. But the idea of starving in a garret didn't appeal to me very much, which apparently went with being an artist. So I thought, well, I, my art must be rather more commercial. Commercial art, it's, it's a logical conclusion, but of course, quite a false one. I became a window dresser, and I thought, as I still do, that it's a much neglected art. It's, it's, as, it's, as, it's as easy to look at as architecture. There are all the high streets full of it. Why isn't it better? However, that's another matter. Uh, I heard uh, my school was a co-educational boarding school founded in 1842, which is rather interesting. And I heard that a girl with whom I had acted once or twice at school, and, and rather successfully from my point of view, had gone to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art and had decided to become a professional actress. And I was suddenly struck, like St. Paul, uh, uh, with this blinding light of course, I must be a, an actor, and actually, I hadn't realised what earn one's living at it. It was a, a, a most wonderful revelation. When you were accepted as a conscientious objector, they sent you to ENSA, or did you volunteer to go to ENSA? No, it was the other way round. <coughs> I volunteered to go to ENSA when I was uh, just after my 17th birthday. Somebody in the amateur theatre that I'd joined, in order to find out which was stage left and which was stage right, suggested to me that a way in might be through ENSA, whereas there were no men around, they were always looking for men. So I took a day off and, and went to Drury Lane and, and said, in effect, uh, I'd like to be an actor, please. And they said, in effect, jolly good, come on in. <laughs> when they discovered that I was, in fact, 
I intended to register, or had registered by then as a conscientious objector, they uh, chucked me out. You could ride a horse. You acted in Robin Hood, which I remember seeing frequently on the television screen. Yes, oh, it, it, it's on now, I believe, and one shouldn't say so, but it's a, a, another channel. Were you a good horseman? Not bad. Never did much jumping, I have to say. But, um, but I, I wasn't, I could, I could sit on a horse all right, and I knew how it looked. Our riding master, we had a riding master, said that actually actors were very much easier than most people because they knew how it looked. You, you, you knew that you'd got to sit up straight and your hands had got to be down, your heels had got to be down. And that's a very good start if you're going to ride a horse. Do you ever fall off? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Remember once, the first time I was really going to have to ride properly, I was put up on a horse. And anyone who is a novice horseman knows that it, it feels like being on top of an 11-story building with legs. And the... Uh, the riding master said, you're right up there. I said, yes, uh, yes. He said, do you know what to do? I said, yes. Ah, well, he said, uh, if she tries anything, just hit her. I said, what's she likely to try? And he said, well, they're not riding school horses these, you know, at which the wind-up started to begin, you know, about uh, the, 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 the routine to filming a piece. Roll, running! The sound man says, uh, clappers, action, so on. When it came to action, the director said, action! And the horse bolted away from me, and I arrived back ten minutes later with my arms around its neck. Thereafter, they said, clappers on end. Robin Hood would have been filmed, but television in those days was live. Was that a frightening experience? Terrifying, terrifying, absolutely terrifying. I think it was Noah Coward who said it was like being on stage without an audience, uh, doing radio without a script, and a film in one take. Absolutely terrifying. And in those days, uh, when we started, you, you couldn't, uh, couldn't edit. You couldn't say a rude word and have it cut out later on. And even when they could, it was a, it was a very difficult and expensive business. They eventually graduated to what was called a cut key. Somebody sat at the side of the set with, with, a, with a key which would cut the sound from the, from the viewers. So you'd see people going, to be or... Or not to be. That's the question. That's how it would go. A bit disrupting. You talked earlier about the bravery of acting, and I agree with you. People go out on a stage and give everything they've got to an audience. Uh, did you suffer much from stage fright? Very little to start with. It's something that grows on you, I think. Gets worse. When you're young, you can do what the hell you like. As you get older, especially as you are given more responsibility, and you're... Failure is very, very much more important. That's when it gets quite frightening. Uh, the only time, no, it's not the only time at all, but the first time I really experienced stage fright, I didn't know what it was until then, was when I went on stage in a very long run once. I'd been going about 11 months in uh, Severed Head, by Iris Murdoch. And I went on one night, rested, refreshed, ready for anything, and suddenly, in the middle of the first scene, I, I had no idea where I was, or why I was there, why I was wearing these clothes which I knew weren't mine, uh, what those people had come to see. It lasted a fifth of a second, perhaps, but I was sweating when the seconds were over, and the next night, nobody even noticed it was so quick, the next night it happened again, the next night twice, and I became an absolute jelly eventually. I was, I, I remember going to a party one night and coming away late at night and seeing some people with oxyacetylene light or something mending a hole in the road. And I looked at them, I thought, what a, I, without any irony at all, what a wonderful, wonderful job. 
to know when you're getting your pay, to know what your hours are, just simply digging a hole in the ground. Oh, seemed like a joy. In the 60s, you appeared in Alan Bennett's 40 Years On <coughs> with Gilgood. What did you learn from him? Oh, what I learned from him was, I hope, simplicity and quietness. He understands absolutely what he's talking about. He says it fluently and easily. He doesn't fidget or make unnecessary movements. He delivers the author's message as perfectly as it can be done. And standing next to him for six months watching that was, I hope, a great lesson. Was he an encouraging colleague? Oh, most. Most. And, and, and very kind. I naturally deferred to the great man a good deal. It was a long time. I mean, many years later, you took over the, his part. You <laughs> played <laughs> yes. his role. Yes. Yes, it was. It was many years later, with great trepidation. He, 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 he was a long time before he, he said, Oh, please call me John because I was calling him Sir John all the time, and he was yielding to me on the downstage foot when we had a scene together, and I was yielding to him, and he was yielding again. I thought, any minute now we're going to be in the big drum. <laughs> yes, I took over for him, from him uh, 17 years later, it was. Uh, I met him on the steps of the Garrick Club, and he said, I hear you're going to 40 years old. I'm so glad you've been marvellous. Because they asked me, I didn't want to do it. <laughs> One of his famous bricks. <laughs> Are actors vain? Do they want to be <coughs> spotted in the street as you were? I suppose they are, yes. I, I got over that period quite quickly and uh, would really rather not have been recognised in the street, although I hope I dealt with the times when I was as gracefully as possible. I really don't understand those actors who brush autograph hunters aside and so on. I, I hate to see that, especially with their children. The big breakthrough in, in, in your career, as well as the marvellous parts you played on the stage, I suppose was appearing in The Good Life on television. Ah, yes. uh, with Richard Briers and um, Felicity, Felicity Kendall, Kendall and Penelope, Penelope Keith. Keith. It was terrific fun to watch. Was it fun to make? Oh, lovely. It was a sheer delight. We met for the first time uh, as a team all together in someone's garage in Northwood before dawn, one winter's morning. <laughs> and uh, um, the, the host, our hostess wouldn't allow actors into the house, and quite rightly, I expect. Uh, and we became very good friends almost immediately. I knew Felicity slightly. I'd, I'd done a television play with her. I only knew Penelope from watching her on television. And I knew Richard Bryars because we served together on the Council of Our Union, Equity. Uh, but I didn't know him very well. But we became very firm friends, and we've remained so, which is nice. Did you feel, as the series went on, that you and Penelope, that Margot and Jerry, were rather stealing it? Well, there was a piece in the Evening Standard one night which said we were. And Peddy and I got in early the next morning, earlier than the other two, and we mentioned this and said, oh dear, how difficult it's going to be. The neighbours have stolen the the uh, show, and we decided together that we wouldn't say anything about it. We'd pretend we hadn't read it. And then Richard and Felicity came in more or less at the same time, and Richard said, oh, marvellous, isn't it? You get all the praise, never mind, I get the billing and the money, and uh, passed it off as a joke, which was uh, the spirit in which we did the whole thing. You went on to play Jim Hacker memorably and happily in Yes Minister and Yes yeah. Prime Minister. Would you rather have played Sir Humphrey? <laughs> Well, at first, I did want to play Sir Humphrey, yes. I thought, well, Humphrey, it's lovely, that wonderful undercutting all the time and the, the deferential, the Jeeves to, uh, to Jim Hacker's Bertie Wooster. And, uh, and he has, after all, got the last line of every episode, yes, Minister. Uh, but the author said, look, we wrote it for you. And I'm, I'm, I'm easily flattered, but I think somebody who wasn't would have been flattered by that. And... They said, after all, remember, he is the only one whose character develops. So Humphrey has to stay the same the whole time. So, a little bit grudgingly, I, I agreed those terms and 
Did you model model it on anybody? Myself. Really? Explain. Yes, I, I thought, well, I'm somebody who is very interested in politics, so I always have been. I know nothing about administration. That's like Jim Hacker. Had I been active in one of the political parties rather than as an actor, I would, no doubt, by the time the landslide arrived, have got quite high up in the party hierarchy and may have found myself in charge of a department. So really, it's, I, I behaved just as I would have behaved had Jim Hacker been me. <laughs> you could say that your career as an actor <clears throat> blossomed late. Is that fair? I mean, were you a better actor later on, or was it just that you were better suited to middle-aged roles? I think, um, no, I think uh, I've sometimes been accused of false modesty, but uh, I can't be accused of that now because I think I, I was a good actor from quite early on. And I was good in a, a multitude of parts, both serious and comic, but mostly comic. Uh, I mean, comedy, I realised, was the route to take if I wanted to get on, because it's, uh, it's a bit more marketable. Uh, no, I just... Perhaps I didn't have the luck, uh, and I don't really, really and truly think I had the ambition. I had to wait till my wife kicked me on a bit. What's the secret of comic acting? The courage, again, courage. It's the, it's the courage to pause, I've always felt. It's, oh no, it's not just that, of course, it's courage and it's surprise. The element of surprise is marvellous. When you say the thing that is not expected of you, and catch people off guard in that way, catch the audience off guard. Yes, I think it's... it's, it's, it's and, of course, it is, um, it is a, a feeling right at bottom, I suppose, why so many comedians uh, appear to be such unhappy people, that this is a veil of tears we're in, and uh, if, we, if we don't laugh, we're going to cry, so let's laugh. In those television series, and also to some extent in, on the stage, in home and no man's land, you've played in groups of four, in groups of three, in groups of two. Do you enjoy that? Yes, I do. I see it very much in musical terms, I suppose, really. It's like a quartet, a trio, a music, and particularly with something like Pinter's No Man's Land, and certainly with Home. Uh, it was very much like music, little ensemble, little duets, solo pieces and so forth. And, and in, in sound as well, I think of it in very much in musical terms. Uh, even using to myself Italian term, you know. <laughs> what do you expect from a director when you're appearing in a play, rehearsing it? What do you expect from it? Uh, what one is thrilled to receive is confidence. If a director can give you confidence. I know there are brilliant directors who specialise in undermining actors' confidence, but uh, they're not the ones I take to very well. Uh, I think that's it, giving you, giving you the courage, giving you the confidence. That, that's, that's tremendous. Of course, he, he's got his own, he or she has got his or her own concept of how they want the piece to be, and one has to thrash that out between you. But. Um, do you always get what you expect from a director? Have you ever been left in the lurch? I... Now you're inviting me to commit slander, I suppose. But, and I mustn't do that. Uh, I have sometimes not got I, what I wanted from a director. Not got the support. Uh, perhaps they've been looking after one of the other actors a little bit too carefully, or something like that, which has not helped the play. I was in one play once where I think the director's only direction was to keep such and such an actress happy. And of course, she grew more and more desperate as time went on, rather like children who don't know what their limitations are, don't know what their limits are. And. Uh, Eventually, I thought, well, I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm, I'm being asked to change my performance so that it is not as good as it was. And it changed and it changed because that's what we were all told to do. And eventually, I thought, 
no, I cannot do this. This is what triggered me really into becoming a member of the Society of Friends, funnily enough. I went, I, I went to meeting one Sunday and thought I must think about this very, very seriously and very carefully because it's very worrying. And they, there used to be a little book, it's got a different name now, called Advices and Queries, which Quakers sometimes use. And somebody got up and said, I'm going to read from the queries, query 17, he said. Query 17 said, do you faithfully carry out your daily work? Are you conscientious in delivering the goods? I'm paraphrasing it, of course. Uh, when you're asked to lower your standards, do you resist? And the, the hair rose on the back of my neck. It was the very terms in which I've been discussing this problem with myself. I thought this is worth following up. And from Monday on, things were a little different. <laughs> the last few years have been tough for you. Where have you got the strength to go on through them so bravely? It's rather like uh, Lady Thatcher said once, mistakenly, uh, there is no alternative. I, I, I haven't, I, I, I do wish I hadn't got the difficulties that I have, but I have got them, so one gives a Gallic shrug. Has your family been important to you at this time? Oh, absolutely vital. My wife, of course, in particular. She is my guardian angel. I really could not have existed without her. My, my four children are immensely supportive, three sons and a daughter. They're all absolute darlings, and they, they bring up almost daily to ask who I am, and they come round and see me and so on. They're lovely. How would you like to be remembered? Well, I've, I've said this at the end of my book, uh, and it sounds, again, it sounds mock modest, but it's not, if you think about it. I have said that somebody, a journalist, once asked me what I would like my epitaph to be, and I said, I think I would like it to be, he did very little harm. And that's not easy. Uh, m most people seem to me to do a great deal of harm. If I could be remembered as having done very little, that would suit me.